We're in the fourth chapter, and we're going to undertake on tonight uh, the first five verses of this book. And uh, the focus scriptures will be found uh, in uh, the, for this chapter, in really the first five verses that we're going to explore. And we're looking at this awesome charge for all disciples all believers to preach the gospel, to minister uh, to those. Give me one moment. To minister to those who are lost, those who are broken, uh, to connect them to the healing power of the Holy Spirit, to the sanctifying power of Christ Jesus our Lord. Welcome. Welcome, Sister uh, Missionary uh, Graves, uh, Evangelist James, Deacon James. I think I see another on an LG that I don't know who it is, but welcome anyway uh, to Bible study. Uh, we're, we're giving a few moments for everybody to join. Uh, we're in the second epistle written to Timothy. Uh, the fourth chapter, and we're going to look at the first five verses. And our subject matter on today is going to be preaching the word, the need, the commandment, uh, the demand for us to preach the word of God. Come on in. Blessings upon you. Those of you who are joining us by way of Facebook Live, we do pray that the blessings of God continue to be present upon your life. Welcome. I don't see the name, but that person that just joined us uh, with their iPad, welcome. It's your sister. <laughs> All right. <laughs> welcome, missionary. All right. It won't be long. Your mom. 
Welcome, mother. I would ask that everyone mute your mics as we go in. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our minds are clear. Turn our hearts toward God. Gracious and eternal Father, we do thank you. We thank you for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for a reasonable portion of strength. God, we ask that you be with us ever present as we engage your word. Illuminate this word on tonight. Allow it to be uh, a resounding effect, have a, a resounding effect in our lives. Uh, allow it to be life for us. This is our prayer on tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's read uh, these five verses. I'm reading from the New International Version, the Bible. Uh, I, I do hope everybody brought your Bible. It reads, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. You have a paper bound. Go ahead and underline that. Christ Jesus will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. I know a lot of people like to skip over that. Uh, we only get the correcting and the rebuking part, but it says here, uh, Paul tells Timothy, you need to encourage also, and you need to do these three things with great patience and careful instruction. Verse number three, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. There's going to be a time where people, they just don't want to hear the truth. And I believe we're living in that time right now. Instead, they will suit their own desires. They will gather around themselves a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. You, you know, that, that's been since the beginning of time. Those who are bent on, on doing uh, what the flesh desires for them to do, uh, they don't want to hear from someone who's going to speak contradictory to what their desire is. He says, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Our last verse on tonight. But you keep your head in all situations, you, you, you got to remain focused. You, you got to remain focused to the task at hand. You got to endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. That means you, you, you can't just uh, reside in, in the service only, uh, but you got to take that service out into the community outside of these four walls says, do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all your duties of the ministry God has assigned to your hands. I know we are being bombarded in this time, in this culture, in this day and age with all kind of messages, with all kind of imagery that offers hope after hope. But above all the message and above all the hope uh, that bombards this world, there is one message that's more meaningful than all the rest that man needs to hear. And that is the message of Christ Jesus. The one who is the hope, the one who is uh, our, our only hope uh, to be reconciled with the Father in life eternal. God has committed unto all of us who accepts his invitation. He's committed unto us a ministry. Paul says there is uh, 
in ministry that God has given us, uh, that he has planted something in these earthen vessels, and that something is the Spirit of God, uh, that we ought to go as Jesus gave the disciples the commission and to the highways and to the hedges and compel all men, women, and children to come on to Christ. There is uh, four uh, particular things as to why uh, we must preach. We must preach the word of God, number one, uh, because God's eye uh, is, is, is on all of us. God and Christ Jesus is watching you and I, watching every person that proclaims themselves to be a believer, proclaims themselves to be a disciple of Christ. Secondly, we ought to preach the word of God uh, because the word of God has to be preached. The Bible declares it is to be preached. Thirdly, we ought to preach the word for uh, there will be a great apostasy. There will be a great falling away. And we want to make sure we're doing our job to save all those that would be saved. And uh, we don't actually do the saving, but we're positioning them. We're sharing our faith. We're sharing the gospel so that they have an opportunity uh, to come to Christ. And those who are uh, already in uh, the vineyard, they will have an opportunity not to fall away. But fourthly, we ought to preach the word uh, for we must completely fulfill the mission and ministry God has given us. Now let's tackle the, the first one because God and Christ Jesus is watching us. Paul says, I give you this charge, Timothy, to preach the word. It's verse one and two. You must preach the word for God and Christ are watching. Their eyes are upon you. They are watching to see if you preach the word and, and not preach your opinion, not preach the opinion and, and uh, accolades or, or theories of others, uh, that, that God and Christ Jesus is watching to see if you're going to preach Christ because Christ Jesus is the very word of God. He is the glorious gospel of our salvation. The word is the scripture which we hold in our hands and study and teach to all who will give their lives Christ Jesus our Lord. The word that we are to preach is the very revelation of God himself. The record of what God wants us to know, the record that he is recorded in the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Bible, uh, the, the unbelievable love of God, that's the word, that tells us about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that's the word, who came to earth to save man from the sin and suffering of death. Death in this world, damnation to come in the world to come. The word, the great mercy of God that he has poured out upon us through the death of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. The word, the coming, the resurrection that we just celebrated on this past Sunday but also attached to that resurrection is God's judgment, his judgment of all man. This is the word that we are, are to preach. We are to proclaim it from the hilltops. We ought to proclaim it from the valley low. We ought to proclaim it with holy boldness and courage, no matter what situation, no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, no matter what trial, no matter what threats of men, we ought to preach the unadulterated word of God, the word of this living God will bring life. It will bring peace. It will bring joy. We ought to preach the word. There are three strong reasons given uh, by Paul as to why we ought to make sure that we're preaching 
the word of God. Number one, the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the judge. He will judge those, we read it in scripture, those who will be living when he returns. And he will also judge those who have died. He is the judge of the living and the dead. And this ideal of, of God judging uh, both uh, these categories uh, is twofold. Uh, first, he is going to judge us as to whether or not we fulfilled the commandment. Did we preach the word of God? If he calls us to preach, and he, he's, he's called all of us to share our faith, to share the gospel. But there is a difference between uh, those who have been called to pastor, preach, teach, and uh, those who have been saved uh, and who are being sanctified and made whole. Uh, there's a difference of sharing the faith and preaching the gospel. Uh, I want to differentiate those two. We all ought to share our faith. Uh, and we all ought to share Christ, but there is a difference between a, a, a minister of the gospel and, uh, well, I know we, we get tired of hearing all of these uh, dichotomies, these lines of deep marcation uh, between our roles as disciples, um, but it's what it is. There, there's always an order. There's always a system uh, to, to what God would have us to do. Um, in everything in life, there is system, there is order. So uh, it, it's no different here. Um, but those of us who have been called, those of you, I, I must say, who have been called, it is your charge to preach the gospel. Uh, so secondly, uh, he is going to judge us as to whether or not we preach the word. If, if we preach, as I said earlier, our ideas and the ideas of men instead of God's word, we will be judged. And the word of God says we will also be condemned. If we preach a mixture of man's ideas and God's word, we will still be judged and condemned. Someday, even Brother Timothy, his work will be tested and that test will be carried out by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Uh, so all Christian work must be good enough not to satisfy man, but to satisfy Christ Jesus, our Lord. We must do every task in such a way uh, that Christ Jesus will be pleased. We must do every task in such a way that we can take it and offer it to him, that he will be glorified by what we offer to him. He is not concerned with either, either the criticism. And I'm saying he, I'm talking about the, the minister, the preacher, the person who's sharing their, the word of God. He, he is not, he or she is not concerned with either the criticism of men nor the verdict of men. The one thing that every minister must covet is to hear these two words, well done. And who, who will be saying these two words? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. If we all within the church and even within the world at large uh, did our work in that type of spirit, uh, the difference in life would be incalculable. You, you couldn't measure it. You couldn't add it up. It, it, it would save us from that touchy spirit that many of us uh, ha have been led by, that touchy spirit which, which is offended by the criticism of others, that, that, that spirit uh, that, that's always concerned about what others have to say about you. It would save us from self-importance that, that, that spirit that makes us want to want, want, want puff ourselves up in pride, uh, to, 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 to feel more important uh, than, than the next person, uh, to think more highly of ourselves than what we ought to, uh, which is concerned with matters 
of personal rights and personal prestige. Uh, to, it would save us if we had the, the spirit of Christ and only covet him saying, well done. It would save us from self-centeredness, which demands thanks and praise uh, from everyone you do something for. Even those who hear of your good deeds, you, you demand thanks and praise from. Uh, for every act that you commit keeps you from that self-centered spirit. It would save us from being hurt by others who are ungrateful. They, they show no gratitude for the things that we do. Turn very quickly to the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. And the 27th verse. Matthew says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory. If you haven't muted your phone uh, or your, your device, please, please mute it. The Son of God, known as the Son of Man, is going to come in his father's glory with angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he or she has done. There it is. It's right there in the word. Turn to the Acts of the Apostle, Acts the 10th chapter and the 42nd verse. Where it says, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Flip on down to the, or over to the 17th chapter. Of that same book, 31st verse. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. By the man he has appointed, he has given proof of this to all men by raising him, that man, Christ Jesus, from the dead. Book of Romans, 14th chapter, 10th verse. Paul says, you then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. This is where you get, do not judge, the word of God says, lest you be judged. Our job is to encourage, to correct, to rebuke, to rebuke, and we ought to do so with patience and careful instruction, not judgment. Second Corinthians, fifth chapter, and the tenth verse. Paul says to the church of Corinth, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due to him or her for the things done while in these bodies, whether good or bad. So your good is gonna be judged. Your bad is gonna be judged. You're going to have to stand in complete judgment of all behaviors chosen of all actions modeled, and even your thoughts, you're going to be judged. Second, why we must preach the word, the Lord Jesus Christ himself will appear in glory 
as the returning conqueror. We must preach the word and we must keep in mind as we preach the word that Christ is going to return. And every minister of the Lord's gospel must be prepared. Paul says in season and out of season, you ought to have a word. You ought to be prepared and you ought to be preparing and this is how you prepare. You prepare for the return of Christ, our conquering savior. savior. You're preparing by preaching the word. Conquering Lord is returning. And if we fail to preach the word, we stand before him unprepared. We stand before him embarrassed and ashamed. If we fail to preach and subject ourselves to him in this world, we fail to preach his word and we subject ourselves to his judgment. In the next, we stand to be judged by him and the scripture says by him alone. There is going to be a day of our Lord and that is the judgment seat. Turn to That Gospel of Matthew again, the 24th chapter and the 44th verse. St. Matthew says, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. You all heard the stories about the foolish or, or the, the bridesmaids, the wise bridesmaids and the foolish bridesmaids. They were waiting on the groom to come. They were supposed to have oil and their lamps trimmed, but the foolish ones did not bring the proper equipment. They, they weren't prepared and they were asking to borrow some of the other bridesmaids oil. They said, no, if we give you some, we won't have uh, the proper amount for us to be received by the groom. We don't want to be like those foolish bridesmaids who did not prepare, did not have what they needed. And when the bridegroom came, they were somewhere at the marketplace. They were somewhere trying to find what they needed, but did not prepare ahead of time. You need to be prepared for Christ's return. You don't know the day. You don't know the hour. So it behooves you to be prepared ahead of time. And again, how do you prepare? Paul says simply, you ought to be preaching the word of God, not the opinion of man, not the ideas of man, not your own ideas, but the word of God. And what is the word? Christ Jesus is the glorious word of God. St. Luke, 19th chapter, 13th verse. Luke says, so he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 manners. He says, put this money to work. He said, I need you to put it to work until I come back. You all know how the story goes. The one who had the least amount didn't do anything. The one who had the most doubled their, their, their profitability. And when that king came back, he took from the one that didn't do, that thought the king was a, a terrible tyrant. And he gave it to the one who was productive. You need to be found productive. Uh, just because you're alive don't mean you're producing. I've seen the many of, of individuals alive but not productive. I, I preached a message on that. 
Just because you look the part, just because you speak the part, doesn't actually mean you're doing the part. But you need to be productive. 1 Corinthians, 1st chapter, 7th verse. Paul says here to the church at Corinth, says, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Everything that you need, God has already given it to you. He's given you all gifts. Not, not necessarily saying that you uh, will be the uh, uh, possessor of all those gifts, but they are available to you in the spirit. And we're, we're talking about uh, not only uh, the, the spirit that resides in you, but the spirit of the church, uh, that, that koinonia, that fellowship. All ministries, the fivefold ministries should be active in every spiritual community. And not just any spirit, but we're talking about the spirit of God. You have what you need in the spirit. Four and five. Same book, 1 Corinthians, fourth chapter, fifth verse. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. 1 Thessalonians, 5th chapter, 3rd verse. Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, therefore, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. There's nothing like things that happen suddenly. As labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not, not escape. Things happen. Just like that change that the Bible speaks about in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We shall all be changed. Things happen suddenly. But you don't want to be found unprepared. Make sure you're doing your first work. Make sure you're sharing and you're preaching. Make sure you're living what you're preaching. Make sure you're not judging. It is Christ. It is the word. People are judged without you even saying anything. They're judged by their own conscience. They're judged by their actions. They're judged by their speech. But let's make sure you're not the progenitor of that judgment. Third reason why we should preach the word is that Christ is going to reign and sit on the throne in his kingdom forever and ever. And if we're going to be citizens of that kingdom, we must be found doing the work that he sent us to do. Luke, 22nd chapter, the 29th and the 30th verse says, I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones. He didn't say his throne, but you're, you're going to have a throne in his kingdom. And on that throne, you'll be able to stand in judging of the 12 tribes of Israel. That's in the Bible. Then you will be one of the judges, but not here on earth. You got to make it to the kingdom. Preach the word, 
For this is the Lord's calling on our lives. Preach the word. The word is to be that consuming passion of every minister's life. We must be prepared in season, out of season, keeping a sense of urgency, grasping every opportunity that avails itself in the lifetime of the opportunity. We ought to correct. Paul says rebuke. But you ought to do these things as you encourage, as you practice great patience and give instructions carefully. That's the key, carefully. For the message of the cross, Paul says, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Yes, as human beings, we're, we're perishing on the outside. But our spirit on the inside is being renewed every day. But for those who don't have Christ, they're perishing. But to us who are being saved, being that's continual, being saved, it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God for the world through its Wisdom did not know him, and that him is Christ Jesus. God was pleased through the foolishness of what? The foolishness of preaching to save those who would believe. Paul says, yet when I preached the gospel, I could not boast of my own self, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach this gospel. It is impossible to overemphasize preaching of the gospel. It's even impossible to fully grasp the importance of preaching. Uh, this is really the whole thrust of this, this passage, this pericope just to think about the, the solemn charge and warning that was given to Timothy and covered in these, these five verses. God and Christ both have their eyes on those who have been called to minister the gospel, to preach the word. The minister will be judged by the Lord Christ Jesus. The minister will face Christ when Christ returns in his glory as the conquering Lord. Face him and give him an account of what he did and did not do. Give him an account of his or her preaching. Finally, the ministers will be placed and positioned in the Lord's kingdom will be determined will be determined by how faithful he or she was in their task and their assignment and their commission of preaching the word therefore the charge is to preach the word of god there are two significant points here and we're going to move on very quickly uh, number one the word preach caruso is the picture of the minister standing before people in all the dignity and authority of God himself. It is the word that was used of the ambassador who was sent forth by the king to proclaim his message in all of the authority and dignity of the king himself. We, we are ambassadors uh, of Jesus Christ. And so the same authority that he has, we have been given that authority to share our faith, to preach the gospel. And that is Christ being alive, being crucified, and Christ being risen from the dead. The minister is to preach the word, which is, or, 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 or what is meant by this is uh, the all scripture. We ought to preach all the scripture, not, not just our favorite verses, not just our favorite passages, not just from our favorite book, but the totality of, of the Bible, the totality of the Holy Scripture. We ought to preach the entire Bible. 
not just those things that tickle our ear, not just those things that tickle our fancy, not just those things that we believe will cause men and women to stay or to flock to our ministry. But we ought to preach the word of God, as Paul said, in season and out of season, when people like it and when they don't. Our job is to preach the word. And let the spirit of God do the rest. Matthew. 10th chapter. The 7th verse, and then we'll look at the 27th verse in that same chapter. Again, we're not to teach our own or preach our own ideas, not the ideas of other men, not the philosophy of others, not the psychology. Uh, we, we're not, even though there is a, a psychological component uh, to the word of God, that's not what we're to teach. We're not just to teach the psychological component, but if you're using that component to, to further illuminate what the word is saying, that's different. We're, we're not to teach or preach simply self-image, self-righteousness, sociology, science, educational development, personal efforts, ego-boosting, man-made religion. But we ought to preach the, again, the unadulterated word of God. This is striking language before we go to the 10th chapter of Matthew, what Matthew Henry used. He says, it is not their own notion and fancies or fantasies uh, that they are to preach, but the pure plain word of God, and they must not corrupt it. And all those things that I mentioned, they tend to corrupt the word of God when we bring those things uh, unchecked to the hour of the word being shared. Matthew 10, 7 and 27. Matthew says, as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near, and he's quoting Christ here. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftop. Thus said the Lord. Gospel of Mark, which is one of the, the oldest, the oldest out of the four uh, gospels, the oldest from the, even the three synoptic gospels uh, that, that are very similar in their testimony. Mark says, say to them, go into all of the world and preach the good news of all creation. Acts of the Apostle, the fifth chapter, 20th verse. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. And then the fourth chapter of the second book of Timothy and the second verse, which is a part of our, our text on tonight, says, preach the word, be prepared in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage, with great patience and careful instruction. We ought to be prepared to preach, to proclaim the word of God in auspicious times and favorable times and opportune times, but also when circumstances seem unfavorable. We ought to preach and declare the word. There is no closed season on preaching. You've got to teach. Whenever God avails the opportunity, you ought to preach. Third, you ought to correct. The word means to steer a person uh, to correct themselves. Not us actually correcting, but to steer them to a place where they see their fault and where they dust themselves off, get back up and do the things necessary to be in right relationship with God. To put a person under conviction you, you, can, you can live in such a way, you can respond uh, to, to the darts and arrows that Satan throw your way in such a way that others are convicted by what they are doing or not doing. That conviction will lead people 
to see their sins. They, it will lead them to feeling guilty over what they're doing. It means to put a person on the conviction of sin and to lead him or her to a place of confession and a point of repentance. Fourth rebuke. It's a strong word. It's a sharp word. It's a severe word that is used and possibly suggests in some cases of impeding penalty. Even where the preacher has experienced failure after failure in bringing sinners or saints to forsake their sins or iniquity, we must still rebuke and correct. A word of warning and rebuke would often save a brother from many a sin and many a shipwreck. But as someone has said, that word must always be spoken as a brother, setting brothers right. It must be spoken with a consciousness of our common guilt. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Shall we continue to sin? No. Will we sin? Yes. Some omitted and some committed. We all have fallen short. But just because we're, we're, we're sin deprived, as Calvin put it, doesn't mean that we continue in sin. John says, we have not been given a license to sin, but because of our sin nature, we ought to find ourselves repenting daily. Paul chimes in and says, there are, there, there's a war in my members. There's some things that are going on uh, that I don't like, that I don't want to do. He said, the very things that I, 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 I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And the things that I would do, I want to do, I don't do. That war, that spiritual war against the flesh and, and the spirit is going to always be there. A poem says the, 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 the key to this is that you got to die daily. You got to surrender yourself daily. You got to repent daily. You got to do the things necessary that's going to keep you strong as a disciple, as a believer. That's praying. That's reading, that's fasting, that's staying in the presence of God so that you can be continually washed in the blood and cleansed of your sin. You got to encourage. You got to encourage with great patience and careful instruction. The minister must encourage with great patience. Marco Thumia, how long can you stand under the pressure? You, you've got to encourage with patience while you're standing under the pressure. I preached this message uh, called, Can You Stand uh, the Pressure? How long does it take you to get hot? And it's simply, I talk about uh, backpacks and thermometers. Will God find you as a conquering champion of those who didn't give up, who, who, who didn't crumble under the pressures of others' opinion, the pressures of life circumstances, who didn't get hot to the point where they stepped outside of themselves, where they lost the spirit of God, but they, in their, in, their, in their standing under that pressure, they begin to model, they begin to be shaped, they begin to reflect the total image of Christ Jesus. I'm still, I'm still working. God is still working on me. I'm, I'm still trying to get there. But it's in our striving to get there that we continue to mature. It's in that knowledge of knowing where you are, that you have the opportunity, the ability to keep maturing in your faith. 
to keep standing, to not throw in the towel, to not give up, to not lose hope, to not lose heart. But to know that God will strengthen you even at the moment of your greatest weakness. He says, those that wait on the Lord, he's going to renew your strength. He said, you're going to mount up on wings as an eagle. You're going to be able to run. You're going to not just be dealing with footmen, but you're going to be able to run with the horsemen and not get weary. You're going to be able to walk in those moments where it feel like all you can muster is a crawl. You're going to be able to walk and not faint. All you got to do is just wait on the Lord. But you got to do so. And that waiting doesn't mean being inactive. That waiting means serving. And this is what he's saying. You need to be serving. You need to be sharing your faith. You need to be preaching the gospel. And when you come to those places, where you seem like you're sapped of all your energy, all your strength. He says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. But he has to allow you to get there so you realize that, how valuable he is. Yeah, you, don't, you wouldn't think that in ministry, in mission, you would think that uh, it is because of your doing, but sometimes uh, we get full of ourselves and we... we, we we think we are, I'm the gift. But he is the gift and he's the giver. You're not the gift. He's the gift. And without him, we're nothing. But with him, hallelujah, we can overcome whatever we face. With him, all things, the word of God says, becomes possible. And so you ask that question, is there anything too hard for God? Even while you're preaching, and the answer will come back with a resounding no. There is nothing too hard for God. That's why you ought to preach. Whenever there's a chance, preach, share your faith. Because God is going to get done what he has already spoken into existence, what he's spoken into the atmosphere, what he's spoken in the spirit. It's going to come to pass. His word will not go, go forth and return to him more but it shall accomplish that which he has sent it forward. You ought to preach. The minister ought to preach the word for there is going to be a great falling away. And if you're not preaching the word, how are you going to be an assistance, an aid to God's kingdom? You got to preach the word. He that hath an ear, let him hear. But thus said the Lord. Apostle John says, he who belongs to God, hear what God has to say. The reason you do not hear is because you do not belong to God. So if you're preaching and teaching the word of God and that person doesn't hear, they don't belong to God. You see your brother, your sister in faith falling away and you're sharing with them what the word of God says, not your opinion, not your idea, not some self-help, you know, uh, uh, touchy feeling. Uh, type sayings, but the word of God, and they don't hear, you ought to shake the dust from your feet and move on because the word of God says they don't belong to God. But rather their father is the devil. We're, we're going to uh, conclude uh, this word. We've got about five minutes. I, I do want to finish these last two points. Uh, the, the, the minister, the preacher of the gospel, he or she, must preach the word because you've been given the assignment to fulfill your ministry. You ought to be full to the brim. But when it comes to our appointed time, we ought to die empty. We're living full, but we're dying empty. Y'all got to hear me. He has commanded us to live full, to give of ourselves so that we die empty. What are we full of? We're not full of ourselves, but we're full of the spirit. We're full of the word. And, and being full of the word will help you not to sin. Said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I, what? Might not 
sin against God. Not, I might not sin against myself. I might not sin against my brother. We ought to live full, but die empty. You know, not every, not every son and daughter has been called to the ministry, son and daughter of God, fulfills their complete ministry. But that is God's desire. Not everyone feels his or her ministry to the brim, but that is God's desire. Not every minister uh, does everything that Christ wants him or her to do, but that is God's desire. Not every minister undertakes every ministry opportunity, uh, but that is what God desires. Not every minister feels every ministry he or she undertakes to the brim, but that doesn't mean it's not God's desire. Just because we fall short doesn't mean God falls short. We ought to serve unwavering, untiringly. Matthew says in the 26th chapter, the 41st verse, he says to watch and pray so that we will not fall into temptation because our spirits are willing, but our flesh, our bodies, are weak. Acts 20 and 31 says, so be on guard and remember that for three years I prayed and never stopped praying, never stopped warning each of you. And this is Jesus talking during his three years of ministry, talking to his disciples. I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears on what was coming. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Well, be on guard, stand firm in the faith. Be men and women of courage. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We got to put on the whole armor of God that we may deflect and guard against the fiery darts of the enemy. Preach the word of God, even while you're enduring hardship. Preach the word, because God is going to reward you. That is the message on tonight. Don't ever stop preaching the word of God. Don't ever stop living the scripture. Don't ever stop allowing the scripture to live in you. Because when you live the scripture and the scripture lives in you, God's ministry will prevail. Uh, we have a few announcements uh, for the week before we uh, leave you on tonight. There will be Welling Women praying on Friday, April the 9th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can catch that information on Instagram uh, for LCM and on our Facebook pages. There will be Sunday school on Saturday. At 12 noon, uh, the Zoom ID is 771-257-3745. Uh, then we will be back in Sunday worship uh, at 1.30 uh, p.m. here at The Walk. Join us uh, in person. We're still keeping all the CDC uh, regulations as far as safety measures are concerned. Uh, we're masked up. We uh, are, are utilizing the proper PPE and social distancing and making sure uh, we're sanitizing our hands um, that everyone stays safe. Uh, so don't have any fear of coming to the sanctuary. If we get to our capacity as far as that 25 percent seating capacity, we will let everybody know we have an overflow and make provisions in the back. Uh, where you can look uh, at the service through closed circuit television, but still be in the house and feel the spirit of God. Uh, but uh, if you're, you're, you're fearing and you just don't want to uh, chance it, uh, we understand as well. It's your decision. And so you can just join us by way of Facebook Live uh, on our Facebook page. If you are a friend, you will get the notification. Or you can just simply log on to YouTube and uh, go to Life Changers Ministry. Uh, here uh, on, on YouTube and you can join in worship with us. Uh, the spirit of the Lord is everywhere. 
Um, but the Bible says, do not forsake uh, together, uh, together a as a, a believing body. And so we have never shut down even during this entire year that we've been under this pandemic. And I believe that says something about our faith. We believe God totally. We believe God that, that he is uh, sovereign, that he's in control of everything and that uh, everything that has happened, that will happen, is purpose in it. And we have to look to him who is the author and the finisher of our faith, that he's going to finish that which he has started until the day of his return. Uh, be blessed, everybody. And we ask that the uh, mercies of God be upon your life and that his presence never leaves you. Uh, we ask that you join us back here at the same place, same time on next Thursday. And we'll continue with our study on the epistles to Timothy written by Paul. Be blessed. Remember, God loves you and so do I. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing you can do about it.